Um, I'm Jen. Uh, I am going to talk to you, as Rory said, about how to build a company that responds quickly to opportunities and save 10,000 lives in the process. So just a bit of a run through of uh, cover today. So agenda, I'm going to cover who I am, why I'm here, and the three steps that I kind of think are the main takeaways that I had from going through this process of building this product, which are don't wait to be told what to build, create resilient teams that can pivot quickly, and act fast when problems arise. So I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But for now, um, briefly, I'm Jen. Uh, so my original background was working for charities in kind of customer service and donor experience teams. And like everyone else I know who now works in product, I fell into it as a career. So I started working at a startup, uh, employee number four, which means I was doing bits of everything, basically. And after a while, uh, an opportunity came up to move into product, which really excited me to move away from just reporting on problems that our customers were having and having some part in being able to say what we built next and how we solve those problems. So I've now been in product for seven years. Um, I am currently overseeing all things product in New Look. I just started there this year. So in that kind of new, new job glow. Um, but I'm not here to, to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about my previous role at Accurex, who are a healthcare startup who builds software for the NHS. Um, and specifically um, one product of the kind of few that I worked on while I was there. But there's one in particular that I'm here to talk to about today. And that's because it helped 30 million people get their COVID vaccines. It's actually now being used for COVID and flu every year. Um, but that's probably a story for another day. Um, and the timing was really important here as well. So AccuBook, the name of the product that I'm going to be talking to you around, ended up having a massive impact on the vaccination program rollout and how quickly GPs and, and primary care were able to ramp up to millions of patients getting their COVID jabs. And you, you may remember this way back when, and we're gonna cast our mind back to the wonderful year of 2020. So this is AccuBook. This is a, a screenshot from the product as it was built. Um, and this is a kind of almost behind the scenes. So where GP users were uploading patient lists, getting text sent out to patients, and then using it to follow up with those who weren't responding. Um, and you may have never heard of it. Acubank, this might be the first time you're ever hearing about it, but you may have used it as a user. And if you've got a text to book in for your um, vaccinations, uh, you may well have got that from us because we did end up uh, sending text to, I think, about a third of the population they used us to get booked in. And in fact, if you've ever had a, a text from your GP, chances are it was from us as well. Um, I say us as Acurex. Um, we were the first company that was sending patients text to book in for their vaccinations. And I think a few others followed suit after that. So as I said, the kind of impact that we ended up with was over 30 million vaccines booked through our software, um, which amounts to over 10,000 lives saved. I think it ended up as uh, more than that that we we're trying to think about how many people didn't get COVID, didn't get into hospitals, et cetera. So kind of talk about impact. It's definitely the most impactful thing I'm sure I will ever work on in, as my, in my career as a product person. So like I said, let's take our minds back to that wonderful year of 2020. Um, at the end of 2020, the vaccinations program was very much on the way. And you may remember headlines like these. Um, if you're in the UK at the time around vaccinations getting approved and ready for rollout. And there was lots of back and forth and unknowns about when it was going to happen, how are they getting approved, all those kind of things. And in early November, it became really clear that primary care and GP um, play a massive part in this COVID, COVID vaccine rollout. And they were going to be the main delivery sites for vaccines, but without much notice. And they, in fact, had to change their ways of working because they had to start working together in hubs, um, something which they're still doing today because it worked really well. But they had to go through loads of change management. And so we started talking to them about how they, how they were planning to run this along their day to day service, which they couldn't drop either. Um, and there was one quote that kept coming out again and again when we were talking to GPs. And that was, we don't have the tech to do this. They'd never done it before. Um, it was going to be the biggest vaccination effort in UK history. And the technology and processes that they currently had at their disposal just wouldn't have cut it, especially the scale and the speed we were talking about. So the only option they turned to was people, hiring people and, and getting people to call. And this 
photo might be exaggerating a little bit, but it's not actually that far from the truth. The, the plan was to use lists of patients, getting staff to call them individually to get them booked into the system, or even send letters to book them into the appointment books with their vaccines. And that was the GPs that are actually a bit more advanced. The more GPs would be using pen and paper and calling people one by one. And that wouldn't have scaled us to, like I said, we were really talking about optimizing for speed here. How many people can we get vaccinated quickly? And so it really wasn't gonna cut it. And so we knew there had to be a better way. And so we were already really well set up for this because we had been building software for GPs and working really closely with them for a couple of years at that point. And so we wanted to build something that would speed up that process of getting patients booked in. We knew that was gonna be the bottleneck. And so we built a product that was able to send text to many patients at once so that they could self-serve. And the timelines we had were really, really tight. And it's something that's not that fun to have in product when you actually have a timeline and a deadline doesn't work that well with Agile sometimes. Um, so we started talking to practices in November and trying to figure out how we could help and what they knew about what they had to do. And we made that decision to build AccuBook on the 13th of November. And so in terms of those timelines, we knew we had to have something live kind of by Christmas. We knew the next national vaccine program was really beginning in earnest and that massive ramp up of new practices delivering vaccines was happening in the new year which left us about seven weeks in the middle, which already we were a bit panicked about. But luckily we were set up really well when we got something live even sooner than that. So we smashed those targets. We had a demo webinar, which kind of worked. There was a bit of manual stuff behind the scenes on the 5th of December. And then we actually went live with our MVP, our minimal viable products in, on the 10th of December. So that was just five days after demoing that prototype. And then five days after that, we had booked in over 10,000 patients. So we'd had 10,000 users through our software on the patient side, which, of course, we were so, so thrilled with. We were so happy that that happened. And like I said at the beginning, there's three steps or three key takeaways that I always come back to in terms of why we were able to do it so quickly. And we learned a ton and there's lots of stuff we didn't do so well, some of the things I'll cover today. But the three steps were don't wait to be told what to build create resilient teams that can pivot quickly and act fast when those problems arise. So I'm going to go into that first one. Don't be wait, don't wait to be told what to build. So we are and already were experts in our field. So at Accurex, they hire doctors to work with product teams and work really closely with their product team. So you can see here Vivek, Satya and Lucy, who were our three clinical leads at the time. So their job's really to make sure that what the product teams are building or even just thinking about building will actually solve problems for our users. And they also make sure what we're building is clinically safe. Uh, so Vivek there on the left is a GP, which means he was able to give us kind of immediate insight on those first thoughts about building AccuBook and really quickly validate, no, that won't work because this is how GPs do a thing or this is the tech you're trying to integrate with. And that fit really nicely with user research. It was already the backbone of our product process. We were already able to just start following our normal process delivery. So that didn't really feel like much of a change to our ways of working. We just had to condense it and speed it up a little bit. And this is an image from Dovetail, which is a software we use, uh, software we use to record and store all of our user research. And it was really nice to have a digital record to come back to later on. So we could say, oh, what did they say about um, walk-ins or you know what happens when the system goes down let's go back and have a look and it saved us having to go back and do more research because we already had some of those insights the thing that changed for us and the thing that we really had to adapt our, our ways of working on was that this wasn't a time where users could tell us what they needed or we couldn't ask questions to prompt some of those user needs when we talked to them about things they said we're not sure yet we're going to get told soon or we have no idea what the DNA, so did not attend rate will be yet. We're thinking low, we'll copy what we did for flu and learn as we go. So it wasn't something that we were able to pull from those user needs and figure out what problem we had to solve. We had to make sure instead that we were the experts on the topic. So even before we made the decision to build AccuBook, we did lots of research into the vaccination rollout program. And you can see here in November the 11th, we published a white paper and this was really key for success because it meant we could help our users 
And instead of having to build something that catered to the hundreds of edge cases and different ways practices could roll out vaccines, we could guide them in best practice and say, here is how you use this product. So we could be a lot more opinionated about those workflows. If we weren't really embedded and I can still reel off the difference between the gap for Pfizer versus AstraZeneca, that's gonna stay in my mind forever. But because we were able to do that, we were able to make hard decisions for our users and it paid off for us. So we saw numbers ramp up really quickly after releasing the MVP. And yes, there was definitely some stuff that we had to tweak and iterate on the go. But most of the time we could see that those assumptions that we were making because they were so well researched and educated actually did pay off for us. So that was the first big learning that we had. The second one was around teams. So creating resilient teams that can pivot quickly. And this was obviously a lot of what we already had set up that worked really well. So the team structure we have here might look quite familiar. Um, this is how Accurate structures product teams like many others. Each team is multidisciplinary, which means they're able to work as a independent unit towards their goals. So at Accurex, we give them lots of autonomy to make decisions on how they work. So do they want a Kanban board or not? Do they want to work in sprints or not? It's really up to them. We judge them on moving metrics, team health, um, and shipping things, basically. And alongside that, this is really why our teams look like. This is the structure, it's really what they look like. So we ended up giving teams time to be teams. So this has meant they got to know each other. What are their quirks? How do they like to work? Which we'll come back to a bit later on as well. So we really encouraged our teams to give themselves an identity. So it's really important that they knew why they're a team, what their mission was, and how they're going to work together to get there. So that might be formulating working agreements or how we like to work documents that they could all share and buy into. And that one on the left there, Empire Strikes Vax, that was one of our, um, the cycle names. So, you know, some of the work we were doing for the vaccinations team. So it was all nice and themed as well. And teams also set their own vision, roadmap and OKRs. So this was really helpful for them, like I said, to know where they're going and what their mission was, where, how, what metrics we were going to judge them on. And a really key way to communicate that to the rest of the company. So everyone else knew this was the most important thing we're working on and this is why. And we may have asked the team to change what they were doing and for something new, but we wouldn't also ask them to change who they were doing it with as well. So it doesn't mean to say that teams always get to decide what they work on sometimes. Like this example, a new company priority came up. So vaccinations or a new time sensitive thing that they would be told, you're going to, do you want to work on this thing? And we may ask them to change that, but we wouldn't also then change who they were doing that thing with. So with AccuBook, although we had to shift with a couple of days notice onto something new, we did it as a unit already knowing those people. So we didn't have to spend time getting to know each other as well. And we also made it really clear to the rest of the company what we're thinking about and then what we decided to do. And so I was constantly sharing updates in our, you can see here, it's our general Slack channel to everyone. Come and join our Slack channel if you want to know more, um, making sure everything was really clear to everyone else what we were doing and why. And this was quite important because it meant that when team members were being asked to do things like interviews, they, you know, they knew they were working on something that was really time dependent and it freed up lots of time. It meant I didn't have to shield them from that. Everyone knew what we were working on. And all of this added up to having a really high level of psychological safety in the team and a really open, honest communication, which meant every, I went around to every team member and said, do you want to work on this vaccinations product? It's going to be really intense. It's going to be really tight timelines. I knew that answer was genuine when they said they were ready and they wanted to. They considered it. They said, yes, they were ready to go. So we had to make a handbrake turn to work on something new, but we did it as a team and it didn't break us. We didn't have to, like I said, go through learning how to work with each other again. We could really hit the ground running and get shit done from day one. And like I said, it's how we judge our PMs. It was something in our progression. So a big part of being a PM at Accurex is leading a high-performing team. And if you're interested in learning more about this, by the way, you can Google and find Accurex progression framework, and you can have a look and read through a lot more about that. So that was our kind of big second point. Um, around teams and making sure that the team worked together really well. And then the last section um, is all around acting fast and acting quickly when problems arise. And believe me, we had lots of problems along the way. 
And even before we started building, we knew the importance of moving fast as a company and how to place those decisions around moving fast as well. So this screenshot here is a, a, a meeting around vaccine go, no go. So senior leaders in the company, our CEO, co-founders got together and said, should we do this thing or not? Because it had lots of implications. It meant taking a team off of doing something else. We knew it would pull in loads of other teams as well. It wouldn't just be this team that got affected. It would affect pretty much everyone else in the business. There are about um, 50 of us at this point, and everyone in some way was touched by us working on this thing. And so there was this go, no go meeting, and you can see the timing of this. And then pretty much not that long after that, I got a message from my VP product, Benji, um, saying vaccine is go. So that line, line in the sand was drawn in that meeting. We are doing this thing. And then we had to take that mentality forward with us, make a decision and act really quickly off the back of that. The same as we had to do when we figured out stuff from our users on the fly. Cool, make a decision and off we go. So that same day, straight after the vaccine, story mapping later on that day. So this was us that same day, hybrids, some of us in office, some of us remote, getting into a room, virtual room, and running a story mapping session to decide what would go into our MVP and what would be left out. And it was really interesting to do a story mapping when you had this tight deadline as well, versus just a what's the leanest way we can do this. We also had to think about feasibility for timelines. So I'm not going to go too much into what story mapping is here. If you haven't read Jeff's book, I'd really, really recommend it. Um, it's a great tool for deciding the scope of an MVP, as well as a great communication and stakeholder to tool as well. And kind of, you know, one of the things here about talking about how we had to shift those ways of working, it soon became really obvious that how we were setting things up and how we were doing things for our normal product life wasn't going to work here. It wasn't going to cut it for us and how we were working and how flexible we needed to be. So in normal times, I was catching up with my tech lead, Mike, twice a week. We worked in sprints and we set weekly goals for the team. So a nice normal cadence. But due to the fast paced nature of what we were working on, this really didn't give us enough flexibility. And me as the PM, I was talking to our users on support. I was you know, making sure on Google, I knew all of the things that were coming from the NHS. So we were finding new things about guidance every day. And so that was either something that was validating some of those assumptions we'd made earlier on, was going against it and we were wrong, or it was absolutely new information and from our users on research calls as well. So this is an example of what how all of that added up to Mike and I trying to figure out how to rework our processes on the fly. And again, we would spent enough time together to have that psychological safety with, it, with each other for him to say, I don't think that session went really well that we'd run together. Let's figure out how to do that. And we were able to figure out um, a way of working. So we quickly found new ways of working. Um, and again, because we gave team's autonomy it meant we were able as a team to go off and change all of our ways of working we didn't get to have to get sign off or change new tools or anything like that we could just pivot however we wanted to get the job done so we changed to daily goals and daily syncs i think during this time period up until christmas i spent more time with my tech lead mike than my husband still a bone of contention um but we had to make sure we were aligned for all of the important bits for that day it wasn't good enough to say where we needed to be by the end of the week for us to keep to those deadlines, we needed to make sure everyone knew what was the most important thing that day. And so we also made sure we kept an open dialogue like this to make sure we could review and improve how we were working. This is just one example of those kind of messages that would go back and forth between us to say, that worked better, I'm gonna go off and do this. One of the big mistakes I made um, was starting to skip some of our, our cadence and starting to skip some of those rhythm ceremonies that we have all the time. So I was really passionate about giving teams time back and making sure they didn't have to context switch as much as possible. What that meant was I said, let's skip a couple of retros. We know what we're working on. We'll come back and do a bigger one later on. And what this added up to was making sure that we didn't have time to talk about how overwhelmed and overworked the team were feeling. And we began to burn out. It was becoming clear that people had less energy, and they were starting to feel burnt out by the stress and long hours they were having to put in. I'm sure you remember that time as well. There was nothing to do. You couldn't go out. 
unless you wanted to go onto another Zoom and do a family quiz, you might as well keep working, especially when it really felt like we were doing something so important. It became really hard to switch off. And I remember that feeling well, and I'm sure you all do as well. It wasn't something that was unique to us. So we really quickly reestablished our retros. And this is uh, some, of the, some of the output from that. This was our retro we did. Um, and from the off, I remember feeling like, oh God, we should never have stopped doing these. It became clear how much the team were working evenings and weekends. And some of the stuff there that really made my heart sink was a feeling like they couldn't take breaks because they were missing something. And obviously that wasn't what we wanted and we didn't want the team to feel like that. And it was obviously going to be very unsustainable. So what we also did was make sure we reset those expectations. And again, the key here was to really act quickly off of the back of that information. So how could we make sure that the team could take breaks, work in a more sustainable way, while also making sure we delivered that important product for GPs? It was an intense period. That wasn't going to change. So I kind of alluded to it earlier, but we came up with a how we're working right now document. So every member of the team shared some helpful info around what times of the day they'd be working and when they're uncon uncontactable for breaks as well. So you can see here that last one around, I try and sync before 5.30, I wanna make time for my family. So this really helped them communicate with each other to say, this is when I'm not around and that's okay. So it was okay for some people to say, I'm actually working more evenings. That's absolutely fine, but it made sure that we made sure everyone had breaks and they were getting downtime as well. And you can see here, it then very quickly fostered a culture of sharing breaks and encu encouraging others to do the same, which for me was really great to see from feeling like I'd let the team down because they all felt guilty for taking breaks. Then we shifted really quickly into a, 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 a culture of really encouraging that and celebrating each other for doing so. And in that thread is a few photos from walks that people had to say, look, I'm out and here I am, here's a pond, I think was that one, um, which was really great to be able to solve that problem. And then the next thing happened, we went live, which was great, but then our support team became overwhelmed. Kind of the intense period went from us to them and obviously including us for changing bugs and things like that. Accuvix was probably the most complex product that Accurex had supported, especially because we'd had to be quite strict about some of the ways of you know, being strict so we didn't have that flexibility in some places. So we had loads of incoming requests around what we're building, what features would come next, and users were just trying to get set up. That took time. So our support team became a lot busier. So what did we do? We doubled our team. So we went from having people kind of chip in from other teams, like I said, it affected everyone, to doubling our support team. Very luckily, we're a startup with funding to do this. Um, and we could hire new people in two days um, from having that problem to getting people coming in. And all that meant was very quickly, we said, get a job ad up, we need more people in. So by the end of the next week, we had some more people trained up and it wasn't as intense a period for that team. And I could carry on talking about uh, different examples of where we had to pivot quickly. I'm uh, very happy to answer some in the Q&A as well. Um, but just to recap where we were before. So our three steps to success, if you have some takeaways from this, are don't wait to be told what to build. If you're in this scenario where you're having to move really quickly, make sure you know your users really well already. Create resilient teams that can pivot quickly. Keeping that team together that's already high performing is going to be, mean you're going to move much quicker than forming a team on that day one. And three, act fast when those problems arise. So don't wait to talk about what could we do here. Make sure you have a culture where you can make decisions really quickly and autonomy for people to make decisions so that that problem doesn't remain a problem for a long time. And the last thing I just wanted to share is how incredibly proud we are of what we've built. And I'm not showing you these to tell you how great it was and how everyone said we were perfect, but because this was really how we were judging ourselves as a team, that impact we were having. And what we set out to do was help primary care when it needed it most. A lot of these quotes you can talk, you can see here talk about how fast they were able to put patients in compared to what they would have had without a vacuum book, which is absolutely fantastic. That one in the top right, even talking about how the product helped not waste a thousand vaccines. And like I said at the beginning, I don't think I'm ever going to have uh, another product to work on that has as high impact as this. And we did have a massive impact. And hence why I'm still talking about this and riding on the coattails two years later. Uh, so this is from one week in January 2021. 
um, commenting on kind of how through AccuBook we help support the NHS in giving the 25,000 years of extra life. Um, so obviously we were one small part and I'm not going to pretend we are why it was successful, but we are incredibly proud and I'm incredibly proud of being a small part of a bigger picture of the vaccination program. Um, and yeah, I'm sure I'll be talking about it for years to come. <laughs> uh, so that was all I wanted to go through. Uh, thanks very much. And I think there's a couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions. Yes, thanks very much. And that was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, I, I liked it. You're kind of touching the nail on a lot of what, what we talk about at UXCX of like the empowered teams, the autonomy, the um, things like that. I have just one quick question. If anybody has any questions, please do, do post them in. Um, we have about a minute, so I'll, I'll try and make it quick. Sometimes when people are under pressure and you, you move to that daily goals, mm. that can actually become a burden on the team because it's kind of, you have somebody tapping people on the shoulder every few minutes going, where are we with this? Where are we with this? So mm. how did you make sure that when you went down to that level of granularity of updates that you weren't distracting the team just constantly asking them for updates instead of letting them do the work? Yeah, good question. I think some of that was the role of the tech lead and having someone who was kind of breaking that down. Um, so being able to work with the engineers together to say, how can we break down these tasks? What do we think is most important? And then the second thing is almost having the daily goals in, in this experience kind of worked as the opposite. So it was very much giving, sometimes that daily goal would be on one person and it would be a kind of cool, Ravi, let's take an example of one of the engineers. Ravi is the most important thing to get done. What that meant at stand up was other people were saying, Ravi, can I help you with that? Is there anything you need? Do you want me to take that meeting for you? So that experience, and I think again, because the team knew each other really well, it almost acted as the shield or buffer to say, I've finished my thing, Ravi, do you need anything before I pick anything else up? So it kind of corralled the team around that most important task. Not always, and it, it does feel like that pressure, especially at the end of the day when you've got your daily task and you're trying to figure out whether it was done or not, but um, mostly it was a good shield. Excellent. Um, well, I, I do have, um, some people are saying thanks for, for sharing on, on the chat. Um, I have one or two other questions, but unfortunately we're out of time, so I might post them into the, the Slack channel. I'll invite you to, to answer those questions there as well. But thanks very thank much. you very much, Jennifer. Thank you.